Well, let's see how many people made it back. Most everybody. All right, so let's kind of wrapping things up here. Almost. Boy, never no, knew there was so much about turbos. What's that? You didn't know there was so much? Yeah, turbos and I mean, even carburetors and fuel injection. When we get deep into it, boy, there's just a lot of stuff to, to all of this. I just take something very simple and make it very complicated. So that's all. <laughs> okay. Well, you did uh, a good job. Uh, let's see. Where am I at here? Point number D. Intercoolers. Intercoolers. Um, intercoolers are something. So we talked about this, the heat from the combustion. And of course, that is going to um, lower the density of the air. So that's a bad thing. So if we could cool the air back down, well, then we get the density that we want out of it. So that's a good thing. So one of the things you can do is to use an intercooler. Um, and I showed you the intercoolers on this machine here. The intercoolers are right here. So now you can see the turbo inlet is here. It's got this red cap on it. And so the, inner, the uh, inlet air is gonna come in through here, through the compressor, hit an intercooler, and there'll be one on the other side too. And so the air is cooled. And where it's cooled from is the cowling has uh, ducts in it that will let air come through and down. So now if we close that out and scroll way down. This is a, a close up of an intercooler, but I picked this one because this is a good spot and this is where damage is. So air has to go through these little tiny aluminum fins and uh, this is the cooling air goes through these fins and then this right here is the core where the actual uh, compressed air is inside of here. So that hot air, then um, the heat transfers over to this these is like fins. a radiator, right? Yeah, it's a radiator, so, so yeah, just it's an air radiator which it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what it is. It's an air radiator. So intercoolers, where are my intercoolers? Used on both. Used on both. Both TCM and Lycoming, TCM, but not all engines. It's an option. Um, and I'm just gonna say one thing and that cools the air, cools air after it leaves the compressor. It cools air after. It leaves the compressor. So not every engine uses it because the problem with an intercooler is it adds restriction to the air. So when you add restriction to the air, then you're going to get a pressure drop. If you get a pressure drop, you got to have more pressure behind it. So, you know, there's, there's always a trade off for something. So maintenance. Do places uh, or our areas like desert areas, would they tend to have air coolers more than like in high altitude, like mountain area? No, airplanes aren't, they don't think of airplanes that way. Like, oh, this is an airplane for California and this is an airplane for the Midwest. It's just going to depend upon the design of the aircraft, what they're trying to do. I suppose a certain amount of it will be um, intended purpose of the aircraft. Is it... Um, uh, of course, it's turbocharged. Is it a pressurized cabin? Is it not? Is it, um, are they uh, ground boosted or not? Because, you know, every, if you're going to um, go above ground boosting, well, then you're going to have more pressurization. More pressurization is more heat. So it's just going to be set up like that. Nice. Um, go back to this one from the current slide. Oh, so I said maintenance. Maintenance. That's what I was gonna write, maintenance. All right, so the big thing with maintenance on these is you have one moving part that is prone to causing all of the problems, and that is the wastegate, because the wastegate's operating inside the exhaust environment. You know what exhaust pipes look like, they're horrible. They look all rusty and, and um, it, all the bolts get rusted on them at the high heat. So there's something you're supposed to use on it. So it's use mouse milk. Use mouse, mouse milk on wastegates. On wastegates to dissolve, 
to dissolve uh, any coke deposits. Any coke deposits. Uh, I go back to here, current slide. All right, so we got that one. I come down here. We got, there we go. There's your mouse milk. It looks like that. Where do we get it from? Well, this is uh, how they get mouse milk. Where, where did you get that from? Disneyland? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the Simpsons. I don't know. Oh, why, why mouse milk? Because can't we use any penetrating oil? Um, actually, this is what the manufacturers want you to use. So, and besides, it's, it's, what does it say? Muscle in a muscle or muscle? Muscle in a hustle. Muscle in a hustle. There we go. Um, it dissolves the, uh, the Coke deposits, which, you know, is the uh, oil that is coked up. And so this is, I don't know, for whatever reason, what the manufacturers tell us to use. So, all right, use mouse milk. Um, some of this just goes without saying, do not, do not adjust, adjust controllers without, without exact instructions. Um, there was uh, in Lycoming school, I remember the, the instructor asked a question. And uh, so his question was this, and I'll ask you. So do you remember I talked about the system that has just a bolt? And so it doesn't have a moving Y gate or anything, or I'm sorry, moving, a moving, uh, uh, you know, one of those things. Um, wastegate, that's the word I wanted. Um, so it didn't have a moving wastegate. It just has the bolt that's in there. And so the pilot complains that they're no longer getting the um, the pressure that they want out of the turbo going into them so they're not getting the right manifold pressure and what are you going to do and so something in my eye which is why i was late I was trying to flush it out so what are you going to do about that and of course the answer that i thought was well okay if you're not getting what you want out of it and it's got an adjustable bolt well adjust the bolt and of course that's exactly what he wanted to hear and i fell right into it and he said aha why are you adjusting a bolt? That bolt's been fine for what, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and suddenly it's not okay? You need to stop before you adjust anything and ask yourself, what changed? Why is it not okay? So we could take that a step further, and a pilot says something like, hey, my manifold pressure is low. I'm not getting enough manifold pressure no matter what I do, um, so I need you to adjust my controller. So you go out and you try adjusting a troller, you, you screw it all up, turns out that what was wrong? Maybe the manifold pressure gauge was wrong. Um, honestly, more often than not, what happens is it's the couplers. I can go back to this slide, that was a good slide. Do you follow the KISS rule? Keep it simple and succeed, or KISS his butt, or what, I don't know. Keep it uh, simple, stupid? Yeah. This one. Okay, so this is very typical of all of the systems. And look at right here. These hoses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's 14, 14 of these hoses. And that's actually um, kind of a light load for most of these engines. They have even more than that. But every one of these hoses is uh, held on with hose clamps. And all it is, it's just holding, um, it's, it's holding this entire pipe on. So this entire pipe, you just sit it in place and you slide this hose over and clamp it to this piece and slide this one over and clamp it to that piece. And it's really, really common for mechanics to screw up and not get these rubber couplings on all the way to the next piece since they clamp it down. And as soon as the pressurization start, it blows one of these off. In fact, that reminds me that um, when I was uh, one of the IA seminars, then the NTSB guy spoke and one of the accidents that he investigated, this is, it's exactly what happened that killed everybody on this airplane, is they didn't slide this little uh, rubber coupling over and clamp it properly. So as soon as the pressurization, uh, we, you had a decent differential between the atmosphere and the outside, it blew the coupling right off. And once you blow the coupling off, I mean, you have to know where's your, you have a gigantic induction leak. So the turbo no longer blows through into the engine, it's blowing out this way, it becomes a naturally aspirated engine at best. Um, now, if it's on this side over here, 
I think you'd be fine except for the loss of the turbocharger because this is, this is the inlet side of the fuel control unit. Once it happens right here, past the fuel control unit, which is right in here, the throttle body that's here, you've lost everything. You have a massive induction leak. All of the cylinders are gonna pull air from here on the wrong side of, of everything. So engine is not gonna run. So these things are a, a huge problem. I shouldn't say it, they're not a huge problem. I never had a problem with them, I just hated them. They're, they suck to get them on and it really sucks to um, work them and make sure that they're absolutely 100% on, but you do what you do and then they're fine. So how do you check? Like, is there like a torque on the hose clamp or do you just like tug on it and if it doesn't come off? Uh, it's, it's not so much that, I'm gonna go back to this, but you realize this hose is, um, let me think. Let's look at my roller here. Do they have like a... It's about three inches. So this is three inches right here. So you need, you know, an inch here and an inch there. So there's a bead in there uh, on the, this metal pipe. There's a, a raised lip. So uh, it's not a real high raised lip, but it's an indicator of what your, where the split is. And I don't, you just have to know. You just have to pay attention to how you're sliding it. So what I would do is I would put the hose and I would slide it all the way onto this pipe and this one all the way onto this pipe. And then I would slide it a good inch and a half onto the next component. Or I would have the component, at least some indicator I'm looking at, to know that I was sliding it all the way onto an indicator. And just pay attention. It's not hard, just pay attention and you won't have a problem. It's when you don't pay attention that you run into the problem. Hey Kevin. Yeah. Are, are those uh, rubber couplings are like, you had to make those or they, no. they come pre-made? They come pre-made. Okay. Um, let me see, uh, keep in, so keep the induction clamps tight, keep induction clamps tight. Oh, on annual inspection, I'd usually go around and, and uh, just double check them all, make sure they're not, they're tight and not, not loose. Um, look for leaks. Um, remember to keep an eye for blue, blue staining. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult uh, on some engines because they're fuel injected right at the head. So there's no blue staining coming through the upper deck. That's just air. Uh, so I have check fins on intercoolers. Check fins on intercoolers. How do they get damaged? That's by the mechanic, right? <laughs> you got it. Yeah, that one I showed you, that was probably all mechanic induced damage. All right, I have this one. Uh, every annual I would get in and check this. So check the check. Check rotating parts for damage. Somewhere I had a really good picture. Let's see, and it's not here, let me see. Does the manual specify what is acceptable and unacceptable for damage on the intercooler? Not that I'm aware of. I think you just have to use your, use your sense on there. Uh, some might, but I just look for really much damage at all. Even a, uh, an inch or so, I'd, I'd say, well, okay, first of all, you want to look for damage and probably you're not going to get much data on that, number one. Number two, um, there's no data to help you fix what's there. But what I would do a lot of times is I would just straighten out any bent fins. But you got to be careful because it says don't straighten bent fins and you better not be straightening bent fins. Well, I really wish I knew what happened to that picture somewhere around here. I've got it. It's worth looking at, let me think. have no idea, but what it was, it was, uh, some of you might've seen it. It was uh, a wrench sticking in an impeller and it was, it was all but destroyed. I wonder if that was in a 309 video. Oh, 
I'm just letting you catch up with your notes while I'm doing that. I remember that from 309. It was 309. Let me see. I got a 309 PowerPoint open. There it is. There we go. <laughs> That's not good. That's why you want to open up and look at the inlet side every annual. Hey, I found your ranch. I don't think that's an airplane turbo. Why not? Look at all the grease and stuff down below it. <laughs> Good eye. Also, this right here, the this coupling here is an exhaust style coupling for an aircraft. Yeah. Plus, the what, worst. what? I don't know what kind of wrench is that. That's not a snap on. So, you know, it's not an aircraft mechanics wrench, right? Yeah, it doesn't have like any <laughs> All right. Uh, check uh, rotating parts for any damage. And, uh, oh, I have a note here, but I'm just going to let Larry take most of this. Uh, V-band clamps. V-band. Worst clamps in the history of clamps. Um, they are killing people. And so I had, um, oh, one of the things that I've, I've left out of this lecture, and you might have saw me roll through the, roll through it real quick. Here it is current slide is um nope operator error there we go from there from current slide there we go it's these things and uh what people what mechanics are doing is these clamps are what hold the exhaust on and so you have to remember that these are pressurized exhaust systems now because the pressure going into the turbocharger and whenever you have a leak then that pressure sort of evolves itself into a torch. And these V-band clamps aren't being set correctly. What mechanics were doing is they were just putting them on there, they were tightening the nut and walking away and calling it a day. But the way that you are really supposed to do this is you're supposed to tighten them up, run the engine, let the, and then go and tighten them up, and then run the engine and tighten them up. And it's like, when do you stop tightening them? When they stop getting tight, and you just keep going until they're all the way tight. And mechanics aren't doing it. They're just tightening them up and going, well, that's, I'm sure is probably going to work. So you need heat then, right? Yeah, you got to heat and cool, heat and cool and get it. Um, I'm also going to bring this up just so you guys know this. So um, this maybe isn't the best picture. There's different styles of exhaust gaskets. And there's three different styles. Um, this is called, well, it's a spiral wound or we call them no blow. And this is a very fine spiral wound metal right here. Uh, then there was another type that was like an asbestos sandwich. And it, well, they all look like this, but it had a very thin piece of metal. Then it had a piece of asbestos, then a very thin piece of metal, right? So the no blow and the asbestos sandwich didn't go on either which way. But the funny thing is there is no information out there. And I don't even know, I don't even remember at this point how I found this. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I read it. There we go. The Lycoming Tips is the only place I've ever been able to find this information. So this one right over here, this silver one, it is a very, very thin piece of stamp stainless steel. And if we look at a cross section of it, it just has a raised lip on it. And that's this raised lip right here. And that's what it looks like. And we know in the field, everybody in the field knows, you use two of them. And so I would ask, and uh, well, one... One manufacturer, somebody said, no, 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 the beads go this way. You put two together beads that way. So that way this little bead is sealing like towards the cylinder flange and this little bead is sealing down towards the exhaust flange and you have bead in a bead. Then somebody else said, oh, you do that and then you fill the middle with high temp silicone RPV. That's the way it was meant to be made. And then someone said, no, 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 they go like this. You interlock them. One goes this way and then you just, you double them up. Always double them up so they're interlocked. And, uh, the only data I've ever found came from Lycoming uh, Tech Tips, page 98, and you use them interlocked. B goes towards, and then you put it towards exhaust with smooth side towards cylinder. So I even drew it upside down here. So um, I don't know, make note of that because I, you're, if you go out in the field and you work on these things, you're gonna, you are absolutely gonna use one of these, these uh, stainless, or two of them at least, and you're gonna be like, oh man, Kevin said something about that. What did he say? Well, it's Lycoming Tech Tips tech tips, which is not approved data, but at least it's there and at least it's some sort of data. So somebody said, well, what are you doing that for? It's like, well, there you go. Let's go.
Can you repeat which one is like the cylinder side and like the exhaust side again? Yeah. Bead goes towards exhaust with smooth side towards cylinder. So the way I would remember that is remember the cylinder is made of aluminum. The exhaust is made of a stainless steel. So would I want the bead digging down into stainless steel or digging or digging into my aluminum? And I never want anything digging into my aluminum. So I'd say, okay, so the bead therefore goes down, smooth side goes towards my expensive side. Not that cylinders are actually more expensive than exhaust. Exhaust is insanely expensive. In fact, if I was to price it out, it's probably for turbocharged exhaust systems, probably more expensive than a set of cylinders. So you don't have choice. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right, check your V-band clamps. All right, that's what I got off that. Okay. Um, a lot of stuff we're just gonna cover is just kind of in and out real quick. Just some notes to think about or to know. Um, actually, it's my last thing before my last thing. So pressurization. Pressurization. You're going to have pressurization in the second year. <clears throat> so I just want to make this note for you. So pressurized aircraft. Pressurized aircraft use upper deck pressure. upper deck pressure for cabin pressurization for cabin cabin pressurization uh here we go the use of a sonic venturi the use of a sonic venturi venturi limits the amount of air taken for pressurization sonic venturi limits the amount of air taken for pressurization. Pressurization. <clears throat> um, in these engines that are turbocharged, and especially if they're turbocharged and pressurized aircraft, you know that it's gonna be flying at high altitude. And so if it does that, you also, you also take upper deck pressure and, and pressurize the magnetos. So what happens is you take out the vent plugs from the magnetos and you install uh, a plug that has a fitting on it and then you take out the other side plug that has got um, a vent and you put a cap that has a very small hole in it so that air still flows through it but the upper deck goes into the magneto and pressurizes the magneto and the reason why you want to pressurize a magneto is because air is an insulator and air is actually used as an insulator uh, in the magneto and when you lose your insulator you have flashover you have sparks jumping all over the place So instead of going to number one cylinder It's going over to number two or six or some other place and you do not want that. So um, So you pressurize it which then puts the insulation back in and then everybody's happy All right um, Pressurization that's all I'm gonna say about that. All right last item we're gonna talk about and I'm only gonna cover it real quick because I think there's maybe one Q&A question on it and uh, something I've never worked on and it's called the power, power recovery turbine. All right, so power recover, power recovery turbine is something that was used on radials and it was this idea that since so much of uh, your heat heat energy is being thrown out, let me get the slide up, thrown out of the exhaust. Hey, why not, why not try and recover some of that? So it was sort of before the turbine idea, I guess, or even if you think about radials, they were already using um, internal superchargers. So what they did is they did a power recovery turbine. So you have exhaust gases would flow through a turbine wheel 
the turbine wheel would then, instead of turn a compressor, it would actually turn gears in the back of the engine through a fluid coupling so that it could be decoupled. That would then help and rotate the crankshaft. So that's pretty much the, all there is to it. And I will tell you this, they didn't love them. And so, let me see, they have another name too. Um, also called, also called, also called a turbo compound engine, a turbo turbo compound engine. <clears throat> so would that have like a really big gear reduction? Uh, I don't know what they did, the sizes and how it looks like it, even according to the drawing, it has a pretty big gear reduction. I was looking to see if I wrote this. Um, yeah, I did. Okay, so we'll get to that. So it uses, uses a turbine wheel. Use a turbine wheel driven by exhaust gases. Use them by exhaust gases that directly, that directly, directly connect to the crankshaft. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Keep this simple. Just after World War II, the Wright R3350 18-cylinder aircraft engine used three power recovery turbines to recover 20% of the exhaust energy. So I had three PRTs, PRTs to um, extract 20% of exhaust energy. That's not on the test. <clears throat> uh, PRT, PRT, this is what the old guys called it. A parts recovery turbine because they were such a stinking failure. So early design, early designs were a failure and called parts recovery turbines by the mechanics. I threw that in there. Uh, <clears throat> this is not worth writing, but when I was doing some research on this years ago, uh, I wrote, I had found out that auto manufacturers are looking to revitalize this concept. Detroit Diesel is doing something, at least at the time, they used a flywheel turbine on the DD-15, which I don't know what that is, to add 50 horsepower and improve economy by 5%. Uh, Ferrari was going to use the PRT to drive a generator that electrically powered the wheels. And they were going to call it like a motor, I think they call it the motor generator unit, MGU. Um, yeah, here the exhaust turbine, compressor wheel, and generator all mounted on a common shaft. Recovery energy this recovered electrical energy that which powered the wheels out of a turn through a second drive called a motor generator unit kinetic <laughs> anyway so there are things in the works but not in aviation this this was not something that i think that, that survived and is now dead the dd15 mm -hmm. is a 15 liter inline six uh diesel engine what do they use that on semis oh, okay yeah, like so, three. all right, that gets me to the end of turbines. But since we have a little bit of time left, for those of you that want to go home early, look around. You should be home right now, so shut up. <laughs> uh, oh, I didn't say shut up, did I? <laughs> oh, boy. Going down. <laughs> as long as it's not McDonald's applications. <laughs> uh, let's, I just want to, I want to, this is something I'm going to have to go over with you guys again. Because it's really something that needs, so you can put your pens down, just kind of relax, try and absorb the energy if you're, the energy, <laughs> absorb the lecture if you want. Uh, if you're not in your, your August, you need to work on your, your uh, weed eater there. You know, that's, anyway. Um, so one of the big projects, several big projects that you're going to be doing in the lab for this class is you need to mount magnetos to an engine. 
And in order to do that, there, you have to understand how to do it. So one of the projects will have you mounting magnetos onto a small continental. Another project's gonna have you mounting it onto a small light combing, and then you're also gonna have to mount it to the light combing engine that you built. And part of the thing that I wanna to get across to you is how do you really do this? How do we do it out in the field? What's the right way? What's the wrong way? And it's, it's not a very difficult thing to, to do, uh, but you can make it difficult. And so I always say, always, I'm gonna say it right now, there is the, the three-step method. I should make it four. I'll make it four-step. I just made it worse, didn't I? Four-step, four steps to installing, installing a magneto. And I don't know what it is about installing magnetos, but it's kind of like the, uh, I don't know, the litmus test. Are you a good mechanic or are you a bad mechanic? If you can put a magneto on, you're awesome. If you can't, you're not. I don't buy that, but it's just a skill like anything else that some people do and some people don't. And if you're not called on to do it, then you just don't. I don't care. But anyway, four steps to installing the magneto, right? And, and one, put the magneto in the position to fire the number one cylinder, right? Got that? Well, first, put the magneto in the position to fire the number one cylinder. Number two, put the engine in the position where the number one cylinder should fire. Three, put magneto on engine. Four, fine tune. fine tuned to exact timing. All right, four steps. How hard could it be? Uh, hard, hard thing number one is that you will be called upon to use this piece of crap, uh, this wonderful tool. Uh, sometimes called the flower pot, sometimes called the E25 tool. This would be a reasonably good tool except that this is a pendulum that should, even as it sits, be straight up and down, and it's not. It sometimes sticks. This disc, or this, this cone back here, sorry, this cone is designed to fit over uh, a, um, an air, a, a spinner for um, the prop spinner. Well, prop spinners are, are stupid expensive. Uh, the spinner on my airplane had a crack in it. And I want to remember what the, I ended up having it welded and I had to find a certified shop that could even weld the thing. Uh, but I want to say if I could find a replacement, it was something like $2,000 or some stupid thing um, just for some spun aluminum. So anyway, this thing doesn't work all that well, but you're going to be using it. And I could try and explain how it works, but I think I would just confuse you a lot. I just want to tell you that this thing right here is a piston stop. And what you're doing and the whole concept behind this is remember when your, your crankshaft is at top dead center, you can actually move the crankshaft right and left back and forth quite a ways before the piston when it's at top dead center actually moves. But when the crankshaft is kind of more on its way down, it, for every little bit it moves, the piston moves more. So it's super hard to find the exact top dead center because there's all that slop in the crankshaft. So you use this piston stop and you end up with this, this cone of denial or they call it arc of denial, I call it cone, I don't know. But, but what you're doing is you're basically gonna turn the crankshaft real slow until the piston stops here. Then you're gonna set the disc, you're gonna turn it slow until it stops here. You're gonna do the math and you're gonna figure out what the arc of denial was. Divide by two and there's top dead center. I'm gonna show you how to do it and I've written instructions for you in lab that will really help you through it.
So one of the ways you actually find top dead center is, is by using this tool. So but let me back up, I digress. So step number one was to put the magneto where it's gonna fire number one cylinder. And this is a Bendix magneto and there are four different holes and you want the hole that's gonna to go to the number one cylinder. And the way you do that is you look inside and whenever that red tooth is there, that tells you that you're about to fire the number one spark plug hole, which I think is, I don't remember. Um, I think it's one of these right here on this side. I mean, it's that one to be exact, but I could be wrong. So anyway, um, so that's how you know. And I'm gonna show you that, that that's, that's how you know. And we will talk about this thing and I'm gonna talk about it right now. <clears throat> um, I came very close to losing an entire aircraft full of people because of one of these tools. And it wasn't our fault. But what happens is in the, the Bendix Magnetos, that little red tooth doesn't want to go right there. They tell you, okay, line the red tooth up right there with that, and that's where it fires. And those of you who have electricity, you should know that's the E-gap position. But it doesn't stay there. Magnets uh, don't like that. What's that? Magnet doesn't like Magnet doesn't want to be there. It wants to be over here to the left a little bit. It wants to be about a tooth and a half off. And so that's fine. And I'm going to teach you how to deal with tooth and a half off. So you have to put it in kind of crooked and then line it back up when it goes on. And it's, it's not a big deal. Um, so what happens is, so we, in my shop, we built a set of four magnetos. Uh, and these magnetos went on a Skymaster, which is the one with the engine in the front and engine in the back. So we rebuilt all four magnetos sent it back to uh, the shop who pulled them off the shop, put them back on, uh, on a, on a Monday morning, we get a call from the mechanic who put them on and he, he gets a hold of my uh, magneto guy and tells him, do you realize you almost killed everybody on this plane? And my magneto guy did not take that well. He's very conscientious kind of a guy and he just freaked out. And they explained to him that, hey, of the four mags you built, Three of them failed in flight. The guy made it back on one working magneto on one engine. So uh, it was a, a, a nearby mechanic. We said, oh, hey, bring them in the truck. Bring them right now. We want to see these things. So he did. He drove into our you know, shop and he's all mad as can be because we we're crappy engine guys and didn't do a good job. And he throws them down on the table. And my guy opened them up. And wouldn't you know it, it was not this red to but it was like the tooth next to it, I believe it was. It was either the red, I think it was the red tooth. We'll go red tooth to make the story. Every single one of them, the red tooth was broken off on all three and the fourth one, it was cracked and bent. So we had to ask ourselves, what the heck happened to cause every single one of the red teeth to get cracked and broken on a brand new rotor that we just put in? These were brand new parts. So he called the mechanic and he said, hey, are you aware of those really cool tools they have now that'll hold on to the teeth so you can put them in there? Guy says, yeah, I love them. They're just smoking gun. So this is a piece of metal that screws in and holds a piece of white plastic. And so when you put this together, if you twist the magneto at all, it's locked to the engine gears at that point, it will break off that tooth. If you bump the propeller, it will break off that tooth. So if you use something like this, you're just asking to kill somebody. Now, in, uh, they do make a new thing made out of uh, really, really soft, almost that, that clear eraser rubber uh, that you can buy now. Uh, and we did buy some for the tool room. I don't use them. Um, but if you put enough, if you put any stress on those, I think it just, this just skips teeth. And so it's fine. But um, anyway, never use these to hold them. Um, on slick magnetos, it's always, it's easier to line them up because you use one of these pinholes back here. And well, there you go, you got a pin that goes in that pinhole. But the thing is, you got three holes. You got the L, the R, and the X. And one of the things I'm gonna be on you about is the L means left hand rotating, the R means right hand rotating, and the X is for laser ignitions, laser. Um, so I'll say, well, which hole do you use for the magneto that goes on the right side of the engine? And you should say, the same hole I use on the left side, which way does it rotate? So, but the pins are kind of nice, but they have the same problem. 
in that if you bump the magneto, if you bump the prop, you're going to bend the pin. There's a pin sticking through there. So that's how you line it up. This pin goes through the uh, distributor housing into the, dis the rotor and picks up a hole that lines up. And when you bump it, you bend that pin over inside of here and you break it. And so you got to buy a new magneto. Um, anyway, um, we'll talk about that stuff. The other ways that you can time an engine is out in the field. This is a light coming. This the starter ring gear support is actually what this is, or starter ring gear assembly. It's two pieces. This is the support and that's the ring gear. But if you look right there, it's marked TC and it's marked with the degrees right there. I can pull it up. I can't see it all. TC, and that's probably 20 and 25 degrees over here. And so these actually line up with two places. It's marked here and it's marked on the opposite right about here. These line up with holes in the starter and back on the back side it lines up with the backbone of the crankcase so all you need is a ruler or a piece of welding rod in the in the starter and you can just do it all off of this so way easier um, this is a kind of a cool tool i used to use but they're hard to set up i'll show you um, you're going to use that thing um, continental used to use a thing in the back where this was awesome that um, it was marked right off this. Uh, this is a pulley for the generator drive. And in Continental, in, in all fairness to them and their wisdom, this pulley only goes onto this shaft one way. It's keyed, so you can't mess that up. However, the shaft goes into a, it's a gear on the other end with 20 some teeth. So you only have a one in 20 chance of getting this on here right. And so when we built these out in the field, what we would do, or we, I'm me actually, I don't know about anybody else. What I would, well, I kind of know how everybody else did it and the same way I did it. We would build up the engine and we would not pay attention to where this would go. And so what we would do is after we built up the engine and we would mount on the gear and torque it on and put the plate on, we would put it on top dead center of number one cylinder and we would restamp the gear or the, the pulley and then put red paint in it, just like it is here. So we would remark it. So if you're doing an engine has been overhauled a couple times or that adapter has been removed, you can see three, four, five different little stamp marks in there. And so, you know, a smart guy would know that, okay, they're, they're, they could be off. And, and if I was going to work on it, just an airplane that was in for an annual or something, I was just doing some mag work, I would always assume that this was not correct. And I would verify that it was correct. Well, that all worked out fine and well until a mechanic um, didn't know better, trusted the, this back here, lined it up. In, it, it wasn't accurate. It was way inaccurate because of what I explained in the gear teeth. And he timed the magnetos to the engine to that. The aircraft took off, detonated like crazy. And uh, the people, I think there was a, there was a post-flight crash and a lot of people got hurt. And so there was a service bolt and came out from Continental said, you know what, you just got to take this plate off and throw it away. You can't even have it on there anymore because people aren't doing the right thing. But um, I guess I tell you that story to tell you that story. And two, um, there are a lot of hidden ways that you can do timing on engines. Continental is actually pretty good about that. They hide things. Uh, Lightcombing does it on the starter ring gear. Continental hides it. Number one, they'll hide it back here. Um, I don't think I have any other pictures. Where else they hide it? They hide it um, on some of the engines, oh, the permold engines. I don't have a picture of a permold engine, but you guys know that means it's a front drive alternator. So you have the crankshaft, crankshaft, and then there's a gear that's going on the front of the crankshaft. And if you look on top of the crankcase, there's what looks like a little oil plug on top of the crankcase. You think, I wonder why there's an oil plug on top of the crankcase. Well, if you pull out that oil plug, because it's not, and rotate the crankshaft slowly, the alternator drive gear actually has degrees written on it so you can time it right in that window. So, so there's that one. Um, O200s, they hide them on the front of the crankshaft. Uh, only thing I don't like about it is they put it on the bottom. So what I do is, well, I can show you. I, I line it up on the top and make marks and so I can see the top when it's on the bottom. But anyway, so I will show you guys all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, this is in here because there was an airworthiness directive on these gears and I do have some bogus ones. Um, so there was a company that was producing uh, bogus parts and these were failing inside of aircraft. And it was funny because 
I, I've actually seen quite a few of them. And then we were doing something at the hangar one time right after I was teaching. And someone's like, yeah, you know, I've got these gears here and we were going to do something I'm like, whoa, these are the bogus gears. Where'd you get these? And they didn't know. So, all right. Uh, that's pretty much it for tonight. So I'll stop the recording. So that means that